You're listening to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. Nation. Today we talk with Mr. Stuart Tomp of CV Sciences. Mr. Tomp is a recognized authority on dietary supplements with 20 years of experience in the nutritional health industry. He was the vice president of North American Herb and Spice, where he served 10 years in addition to his service as global educator for Omega-3 market leader Nordic Naturals. Mr. Tomk is known for his extensive interviews and contributions to noted books, integrative medicine, as well as his 4,000 radio appearances. A renowned educator, Mr. Tomp is recognized as a CBD expert. Excited today to bring you the interview from the NCPA 2018 conference in Boston, Massachusetts. And now, Mr. Stuart Tomp, CB Sciences. Pharmacy Podcast Network. We are at the NCPA 2018 in Boston. I have a special guest. We've been talking about this organization, CV Sciences, all week long. I'm excited to be in their booth. 318. Mr. Stuart Tomk, how are you today? I've never, never had, had a bad, bad day in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Welcome to the, the Pharmacy, Pharmacy Podcast. Podcast. Thank, Thank you, Todd. Thank, Thank you for having, having me. me. So tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about CV Sciences. We want to get into CV the oil because that's really the hot topic right now. But what I understand is just because you might represent it doesn't necessarily mean you understand it, number one. Number two, its application and how it can fit with pharmacy, community pharmacists specifically. These people own pharmacists. They're trusted in their community. They're going to get a ton of questions about this stuff. And you guys are the subject matter experts, so here we go. Well, thank you. It it began for CV Sciences and for myself personally in 2014. 2014 is year zero in the hemp CBD evolution. I jumped ship. I jumped ship from Nordic Naturals. I was the spokesperson and educator for the largest fish oil manufacturer in the United States of America. And one day at one of the natural product shows, someone turned up with some CBD chewing gum. And I looked down at that chewing gum and I said, where did you get that? Now, coincidentally, the man happened to have dreadlocks. That was just coincidental. (laughs) Uh, coincidental. Totally coincidental. Ryan, you know I love you, if you're listening. (laughs) I ran over to the booth and I said to the folks, I want the largest container of whatever this stuff is. I didn't even really know much about phytocannabinoids. I hadn't used cannabis in over 20 years. I don't drink. I mean, this just wasn't my thing. But I knew something was coming. The woman looked at me and said, that'll be $27,500. I said, I'm taking a smaller tube. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) This was about five years ago. And uh, I had my first taste of hemp CBD oil. And after being a lifer in the natural product industry, having run a juice bar, Sherwin's Health Food Store when I was a teenager, then going on to build North American Herb and Spice. Todd, have you ever used the oil of oregano? Do you remember the cure is in the cupboard? My grandmother told me about it. Okay, I built that whole company with Dr. Cass Ingram. So we came from nowhere to one of the cult products of all time. And when I left North American Herb and Spice, I joined Nordic Naturals, the industry leader. So I was already aware of trends in the natural product industry. So I sensed that something enormous was coming. I had no idea that it would end up being the biggest ingredient we've ever dealt with. So what can you do from the standpoint of just keeping people at bay, your uncle, your aunt, your best friend coming at you, to slow them down a little bit, to let them know what this is from a scientific perspective? Because the the literature that I've read on CV Sciences, you guys have taken a very methodical approach to this. Yes, I think you're starting in a very safe, smart, and a conservative position, because let's face it, we have 70 plus years of reefer madness and propaganda, and some of it was very warranted. So I don't want to 
not one of these people that's saying, oh, this stuff is perfectly safe. That's not right. what I'm saying. I think the most important thing to assuage someone's fears is the understanding that the gene, the THCA synthase gene in the cannabis plant that produces THC is different in a hemp variety. Okay. There's a SNP, single polymorphism. There's a difference in true agricultural hemp versus drug varieties of cannabis. Here's what I mean. The gene is THCA synthase gene, and there's polymorphism there because in true hemp, it doesn't produce more THC no matter how much bright light you beat the plant up with. If it doesn't have that uh, polymorphism in the THCA synthase gene, it's a cannabis plant and bright light increases THC production to protect the plant from ultraviolet light. So once people understand that there's a DNA difference between decaf and regular, I'm using that as an analogy, they look at hemp as decaf and cannabis marijuana products as regular and that normally makes them feel a bit more comfortable. When when did you start touching on pharmacy where you could finally start getting the pharmacist involved and be able to have an expert in medications to give us the overarching med to med, drug to drug, allergy to food interactions that you could really plug a pharmacist into that I think is different than almost any other healthcare professional? It is different, but because things are moving faster, the pharmacists, the community pharmacists, the independent pharmacists that are always looking to stay ahead of the market and to really be the vanguards of access, they were all over it early on. Now, it was a limited number of pharmacists because Let's face it, there's this overwhelming concern about legality first, right. instead of easing the suffering of others. That's right. And I think that's where the independent pharmacist had an advantage, because when you look at the law, the incremental lurch towards decriminalization and legalization that we've seen over the years, the trend is certainly our friend. Yes. And because it hasn't been fully adjudicated yet and established, there's some people that just prefer to sit on the sidelines. Okay. The early adopters, however, they saw there was something tremendous here. And they also went back and looked at the medical literature and found out that the LD50 for cannabis is just something that we can't even put our hands around. And the number of reported deaths connected to this plant are almost non-existent. The real switch came with pharmacists, Todd, when we published this work here. In the Journal of Toxicology, we published the first toxicology work on a hemp extract in 38 years. So pharmacists in particular understand the term NOEL, no observed adverse effect level, and that's terminology that falls on deaf ears in our health food stores. Yes. So this is a very specific time in the evolution of the understanding of phytocannabinoids to get pharmacists on board to help A, deal with any drug-to-drug -drug interaction concerns, and B, to help educate people about the potential benefit. We need pharmacists now more than ever. So, Stuart, I'm gonna put this link right in the show notes. If you're listening, you're in your car, you're working out, don't, don't worry about it. We're gonna put this uh, paper, this research article, an assessment of the genotoxico gene genotoxicity and subchronic toxicity of a super critical fluid extract of the aerial parts of hemp. This is fascinating. So we'll definitely put this in the show notes. So this is your first pharmacy conference? Or this is our first big official pharmacy conference. And we, and we wanted to have this document in our hands before we showed up here. What you're looking at here, uh, Todd, is the basis of our generally recognized as safe self-affirmation. Okay. Now, most people don't understand how complicated this process is. So first you produce the document that's in your hands. That's a 90-day repeated oral toxicity study. We feed our ingredient to the Wistar rats, male and female, sacrifice them. We look at for sperm motility issues, any genotox issues. This then helps to introduce the raw material into the U.S. food supply. You have to have four experts toxicologists trained that then review this paper, sign off on it, 
and then you have to create a food product, which we did, and then you've met the federal code of regulations for a new dietary ingredient that didn't go through the application process. It's called grass self-affirmation. So other things like astaxanthin that you're familiar with and spirulina and things like this, they've gone through what's called the grass, generally recognized as safe, self-affirmation. That's what we did. Now, what we can say for our product is it's generally presumably safe for human consumption under the intended use. This is one step before formal FDA grass, which is where you walk through the front door and you get the entire category grassed. Now, Todd, are you familiar with Manitoba Harvest? Okay, they make hemp seeds and hemp seed oil. Those folks did this earlier this year meaning they went through the grass self-affirmation process and they're approaching FDA to make hemp seeds and hemp seed oil generally recognized as safe. If you haven't noticed, that's why you don't see hemp seeds in Campbell Soup products. Have you noticed that? Yep. Or General Mills products, right. because it's not technically considered a food yet. So I'm using these as great examples to show how forward momentum is bringing not only the plant, but eventually the extracts into that same category where they're safe and we know they're effective. So what would you say the top five disease states are where the community pharmacist can start answering questions for their uh, customers, for their patients in their community? What would you say those top five disease states are where this really seems to, to do more um, than what they're getting with any other medication? Anxiety, stress, and depression. That's at the top of the list. We then have inflammation, which we know is a ubiquitous term, and pain, which is probably even more confusing. <laughs> so you look at just those pain, uh, inflammation, anxiety, stress, depression, and I would put anxiety at the top of the list. When we've got pharmacists out there that are finally coming to terms with how dangerous these benzodiazepines are, and some of us have known for a long time, I hope that that conversation gets a little bit more air than CBD as the alternative to um, powerful opioids. Because you may not get the anti-nociception with CBD that you'd, ex that you'd like to get, that you need to replace opioids. But for anxiety, stress, and depression, and especially the inflammatory connection to depression, um, it appears as if the CBD and hemp extracts have this unique ability to help downregulate pro-inflammatory microglia back into their anti-inflammatory phenostate. So is there an inflammatory depression mood connection? Of course we've all thought so. And then the gut-brain connection too is very, very important. So when we add CBD and hemp extracts to he creating a healthy gut, Create, uh, correcting any nutritional imbalances. I think that what we're going to find is that CBD and hemp extracts are foundational. And I hope we look at them like that and less like drug alternatives. So when I think of pharmacy, I always have to put things in categories. I come up with five categories, community, compounding, specialty, um, health system, and long-term care, senior care. Every one of these categories where you have these specialists could easily leverage what education that you provide to really deliver additional answers for those patients. I think of my own grandparent. I only have one left, my grandma, Betty Dallaire, and she is definitely a nervous person. And the way that she usually dealt with being nervous about anything was alcohol, and that runs in my family and um, you know, go to the, the old Genesee is what she drank more than anything. I could see her adding this to her tea or adding it you know, to her oatmeal or doing something where she's using something less harmful to her body based on the, the information that you've come up with. What of the sectors of, of pharmacy, which one do you see um, as the hot uh, one of the, of the five that I met? Yeah. Um I've spent 20 plus years in independent health food stores. I've worked with pharmacies through Natural Partners and a few of the professional shows. So this is not an area that I have the kind of expertise that I do in health food stores. So just as a disclaimer, but my intuition in talking to all of the pharmacists, people that really do own their own pharmacy, the community, independent, the way you started the show, the local person in town who's the trusted go-to source of non-commercial information. <laughs> that person, that pharmacist right now, she or he, has a remarkable opportunity. And the reason 
it's such a remarkable opportunity is my dear friends in health food stores that I cater to and I love so much, in my opinion, are often subject to more marketing and sales where the pharmacists require more factual information to move the needle. And so I really think that this is a place where pharmacists can do uh, an enormous service and I'll give you a great example. I often hear, and you might have heard this too, hemp extracts and CBD are beneficial because they exert their activity at the cannabinoid 1 and cannabinoid 2 receptors, the endocannabinoid system throughout the body. You've heard this, right? Yes, yes I have. Fact check. It sounds better when you say it, though. Well, fact check. CBD has no direct affinity for cannabinoid binding 1 or cannabinoid binding 2. It has no orthosteric activity. That's why you don't get stoned, man. That's why it's safe. THC has direct activity at CB1 and CB2. Anandamide and 2-arachidonyl glycerol, the endocannabinoids, are full agonists at CB1 and CB2. THC is a partial agonist, CBD is not. It's not even an inverse agonist. CBD is an allosteric modulator of the cannabinoid receptors and expanded targets. That message alone is something that doesn't seem to come through in health food stores. Why? It is an easy romantic story to say, you are hardwired to smoke weed because of a receptor in your brain. And it's not true. It's biological coincidence. So we need pharmacists. We need adults to really hijack the conversation right now to say things like this. This stuff is not a panacea. However, if CBD is an alternative to benzodiazepines, that's a risk-reward conversation. Yes. SSRIs may not be giving us everything we were looking for. Maybe there's also an inflammatory component to depression. If CBD has these broad anti-inflammatory benefits that are modulating and dampening neurotransmission a little bit, maybe over time we will see people become sort of less manic and more grounded and that's what we're seeing. It reminds me very much, Todd, of the recent Reduce It trial, drug results from 4,000 milligrams of EPA. Are you familiar with those results? So you know the fish oil thing has been gone on for years, the debate. And being a fish oil guy, I followed it real closely. Every study for the last few years has suggested that fish oil may not have benefit for primary prevention. Isn't this what you've noticed? So just the other day, Reduce It showed 4,000 milligrams was the dose, 4,000 milligrams of EPA, icosapentaenoic acid, over five years. You ever heard of a drug trial like that with fish oil? It lowered coronary vascular disease death by 25%. The stock went from three to $20 overnight, and the statin boys and girls are confused, to say the least. It's new standard of care. There's new standard of care today that never existed before based on something that we've always talked about, grandma's cod liver oil. The drug trial proves that three and a half spoonfuls of cod liver oil versus 4,000 milligrams of EPA may not give you the same result. We didn't have another arm to prove that. Do you like the analogy? Yeah. We always knew fish was beneficial. We always knew cod liver oil had some benefit. Now we can show in a very well-designed long-term study that EPA is different than DHA and EPA combined. We already had that drug, Lovaza, remember GlaxoSmithKline? And it lowers triglycerides, but it raises LDL. Vasipa lowers triglycerides, but it doesn't raise LDL. Well, let's take that analogy and look at the cannabinoid world. We all know, I hope we all know, CBD cannabidiol was approved by the FDA earlier this year. The drug is called Epidiolex. It's 99% CBD. One milliliter contains 100 milligrams of CBD. Now, our one ounce bottle here, Todd, there, a regular one ounce bottle, contains 100 milligrams in 30 milliliters. The drug is 100 milligrams in one milliliter. I'll say it again, our bottle is 30 milliliters, 100 milligrams. They're one milliliter, 100 milligrams. It's not the same thing. The drug that was approved is 99% CBD and it lowers seizures 40% on top of standard of care. Doesn't that sound eerily familiar? to 99% EPA that lowers coronary vascular disease death by 25%. So the dose makes the poison. 
the dose is also critical to get right for the end point in the drug trial. So one of the reasons I couldn't wait to talk to you, one of the reasons I'm so excited about pharmacists is they are the only people that can make sense of that conversation. The pharmacist can hold up a bottle of Epidiolex and say, you don't want that for anxiety. You don't want that for depression and you don't want this for stress. You need this when drugs are no longer effective at reducing seizures of this particular type, right? It wasn't every type of seizure. It was Dravet syndrome and Gaston Lenon. Now, obviously off-label, that's the pharmacy world. But the pharmacist can then say, and we've had this here drug called Marinol since 1985, which is synthetic THC. And we've had this other drug here called Sesamet, which is a synthetic cannabinoid that is even more powerful than Marinol and more effective during chemotherapy and radiation treatment. So the idea of different product, different market, different customer. Let's go back to omega-3. You can eat fish, you might have a different health outcome. You can eat cod liver oil, you can take fish oil, you can take Lovaza, you can take Vasipa. Different products for different conditions, from wellness to disease. Hemp, same thing. You could grow hemp in your own backyard. You could make crude hemp extracts at home. You can buy hemp products at health food stores. You can go to dispensaries and buy cannabis products that have some THC for a different application. We can then go to the pharmacy and we can get Marinol. We can get Sesamet. We can now get Epidiolex. Can you see why pharmacists need to be the masters of this conversation? Because when I run that by a health food store, their eyes get so, I mean, even my best friends in health food stores, they often say, there's some terms in there I haven't heard before, right? So this is why we're beseeching and begging pharmacists. Here's my recommendation. Go back and learn everything about the drugs you already have that are cannabinoid-based drugs. And then go back and research a drug that no one remembers called Romano Bant or Acomplia. You ever heard of that drug? That was a CB1 inverse agonist an anti-munchy pill. They made this observation. I'm imitating smoking pot now. <sighs> I'm hungry. <laughs> they made this observation. This is good when you're wasting away, right? The Romano Bant was an anti-munchy pill. It was a CB1 inverse agonist. We basically stopped the entire thing. You lost weight overnight. Patients started getting depressed and they wanted to kill themselves. They pulled the drug in England and it never got approved here in America. So the target, the endocannabinoid system, that's what we all need to be focused on. The target was only recently elucidated in the late 1990s when we were trying to figure out how THC works in the first place. So the biggest takeaway from this show is that healthy people have a healthy endocannabinoid system and sick people have an imbalanced endocannabinoid system. And if we can help balance the ECS, we might be able to help balance the individual. And this is where cannabinoids and understanding the endocannabinoid system and hyperactive or hypoactive endocannabinoid tone. Are you familiar with Ethan Rousseau? Have you heard of his work, Rousseau? He is one of MD's cannabis experts. He has suggested that there's such a thing called clinical endocannabinoid deficiency. Whoa, wait a minute. We have the receptor CB1 and CB2 because we make anandamide and two arachidonyl glycerol. We make THC. We make uh, canna cannabis-like compounds to help orchestrate everything with inside of our system. When people understand that the phytocannabinoids disrupt the metabolic fate of endocannabinoids, in addition to them having neuro and immunomodulatory properties themselves, they're going to see a, a, a symphony of potential mechanisms of action here. Do you see how complicated this is? So when you take people that are using cannabis or cannabinoids like hemp extracts and we can get them to reduce the omega-6, and increase the omega-3, that already helps their endogenous endocannabinoid activity. When we can get them to work out more, aerobic activity creates the runner's high. If we get them to eat spicy aromatic herbs, um, black seed oil, you familiar with that stuff? Nigella sativa, they're using it for, they say everything now. The prophet Muhammad said it cured everything. Well, what does that mean? It's nothing. Okay, it has a lot of the sesquiterpene beta-caryophyllene that you find in black pepper. 
that ends up being a CB2 agonist, which is anti-inflammatory. So some of the benefits of everything we've been using that are botanical are their role on this endocannabinoid system. Are you following me? You get the gut healthy, the ECS can get healthy. You work out more, nix the six, eat the three. So it's CV Sciences. If we can teach people how to get a healthy endocannabinoid system, then the products are just one tool. They're not the answer. Does that make sense? And that's what I really want pharmacists to understand, that this is about fine tuning and balancing the endocannabinoid system. This isn't about getting people dependent on CBD. In fact, one of our very first papers, we used our product to treat marijuana addiction. How cute is that? Have you seen that? No. Can you hand me that paper, Miles, really quick? The one on marijuana addiction? So this is Scott Shannon out of Colorado. Look at this, here's our product, CBD oil, for decreasing the addictive use of marijuana. So if we're gonna sit here and say, our products are decaf, not regular. Here, we use our product to treat marijuana addiction. Look at this. It went from 24 to 18 milligrams. The young man took less. He wasn't more dependent on it he was less dependent on it. Why? It balanced his endocannabinoid system. That's fascinating. Really, really exciting. So I hope people are intrigued to learn more. It's going to be difficult because there's all these new terms. But I want everyone to spend a lot of time on PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D.gov. And I have a little surprise here. You remember Earl Mendel, he's a pharmacist, right? Yes. Remember, remember the, the vitamin, vitamin Bible? Bible? Yes. Here's his new book, Healing with Hemp CBD Oil, by a registered pharmacist, Earl Mandel. <laughs> so go pharmacist. The new book, Healing with Hemp CBD Oil, is a number one seller, bestseller on Amazon right now under Herbal Remedies. Another way to learn more. Absolutely. Well, we're going to use CV Sciences ongoing. There's two more podcasts in this series. I want everybody to be on the lookout. But in the interim, what's the best way to get a hold of you with questions from pharmacists? Hello, my name is Miles, and I am apparently Stuart's protege. He's <laughs> training me, but I'm knowing a lot about, you know, how CBD impacts our body, and I'd love to try to answer your questions. You can reach me at miles.cyril at cvsciences.com, M-I-L-E-S dot S-A-R-I-L-L. -L. Ask me your questions. Miles is our educator, a new educator. I'm flattering Miles right now, but he's one of the smartest people that I have ever met because he really cares about getting the information right. There's no sales shtick from Miles at all. He used to run the supplement department for Cambridge Naturals, which is one of the most esteemed health food stores in the world. He has a, a degree in experimental medicine, and Miles never exceeds the science. So when you reach out to our educator, he's gonna send you a lot of science, no shtick from us. I'm gonna put Miles' contact information in our show notes as well. Please. So once again, if you're driving or working out, just wait, we can get you the show notes. We're also gonna be tweeting and LinkedIn and Facebook, all of this information as well. Um, very excited, Stuart, about you and your team being here at the NCPA. Welcome to this organization. This is the leading organization for community pharmacy. They do an absolute outstanding job. But I'm looking forward to the to the other series and the other podcasts in the, uh, in the queue. And um, I just thank you for doing this. It's truly our pleasure. And one last thing for the pharmacists. We have medical doctors, we have scientists that are advisors and are on staff. So if you send us a very complicated question, we're going to get you a very complicated answer. We care about the science and we care about the pharmacy community. That's very good. Thank you so much. My, My pleasure. pleasure.